Well, good morning and welcome everybody to this soil carbon webinar. It's good to see we've got 30 people attended. I'm expecting a few more to jump on as we go, but we will get started because we're five minutes past 11. My name is Madeline Florin. I am the Regional Land Care Coordinator in Greater Sydney and working here at local land services in Penrith. We are meeting on various different traditional lands today and I would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of those lands that we're meeting on. Um, I acknowledge the Durug elders from the past, from the present and those that are emerging. I'd also like to mention that this webinar is supported through funding from the National Land Care Program. So the purpose of this webinar today is to provide landholders and land managers with introductory information on soil carbon farming in the context of being paid for carbon credits, but also in a broader context of the different benefits that building up soil carbon can bring. So essentially my objective is that you will go away from this session with having learnt something new, something useful that can contribute to decision making. To help reach this objective, we've got three excellent presenters. We've got Louisa Keeley, Lorraine Gordon and Cara Stitzlein, who I will introduce each of them a bit more thoroughly as we go. Um, they're here to share their knowledge and also to answer your questions. So you'll see, let me get through, that we've got um, plenty of time at the end for questions. And the way that you guys can ask questions is through the um, chat function. And I'm going to introduce Louisa, our first presenter. So Louisa Keeley is the Director of Carbon Farmers of Australia, and she's based in the Central West of New South Wales. She's, we can hear you, yep. And you're a pioneer. She's a pioneer of farm-based carbon offsets and has lobbied for farmers' rights to sell soil carbon for quite a while now. And I think it's fair to say Louise has got quite a lot of knowledge on soil carbon farming and the ERF, gained through her own project on her own property, as well as developing projects across Australia. So I'm going to ask Louisa now to share her screen. Okay, so... So Louisa Kiley, Carbon Farmers of Australia, and yes, it's true, we have been in this for uh, uh, many years uh, to allow farmers to uh, have the right to be paid for their valuable efforts in sequestering carbon in the soils and, and in the vegetation. Uh, uh, so who are we in, in brief? Here's the milestones from <sighs> what this site, what this slide shows is how long it's taken to get to the point where we can now have farmers paid for several actions uh, that they can take in uh, under the emissions reduction fund which is the fund under which we uh, have built a $2.1 billion industry. These are the sorts of things we did to get it going. We went everywhere and, and we saw everyone and we still do. So we, we have, these are the things that we've done to get it going. We've had conferences, we've had field days, we hold an Australian financial services license. Now that is really important because an ACCU, an Australian carbon credit unit, is a financial instrument in our system. So we have now registered and implemented projects over a million hectares. This is a, a, a job for big areas at the moment, but there is a really big push to allow smaller farmers, such as the ones that might be on this uh, call today, to be able to take part in the Emissions Reduction Fund. We must uh, operationalise what smaller farmers can do. So we, we sell carbon into uh, the government uh, market under what's called a CAC or a Carbon Abatement Contract. And we've sold in what's called the secondary market. 
which is the non-government market. Smaller volumes, larger price. And now we're working internationally as well. So we are an industry that is starting to be established. This is the, our vision of the farm of the future. Not only will farmers be able to do wheat, sheep, uh, uh, cropping, but they have got the capacity to be paid under several different uh, biodiverse or uh, markets. So agroforestry, which is simply agriculture with trees, has got a market. Biodiversity credits has got a market here in New South Wales. It's New South Wales, the biodiversity credit scheme. Then we've got the carbon offsets credits. People are being paid, which is what we're talking about today, ACCUs, Australian Carbon Credit Units. Uh, people are already being paid in Australia for water credits to reduce the uh, uh, flow of uh, nitrogenous fertiliser uh, flow into the uh, Great Barrier Reef, for instance, and renewable energy. So the idea is that farmers, including smaller farmers, are now the uh, stewards of a biodiverse carbon resource that's got markets. So no longer are you just a beef or sheep or a, a, a farmer. The agroforestry is like the environmental plantings. This is what happened to us when we were on our 1700 acres in the central west of New South Wales. We were tree changer farmers. We're not uh, successional farmers. And we came into the worst drought up until then, which was called the millennial drought. So on this particular day, when the, uh, when, uh, the drought was just about breaking, we had a huge amount of rain in a very, very short amount of time. And anybody who knows anything about sheep and shearing sheep or uh, crutching sheep, a shearer will not come anywhere near a sheep when it's wet. So what it demonstrates is how quickly it happened. And then our son was uh, managing at the time and, you can, and he decided this was in the John Howard era and he was, we were being told that we were going to need to adapt to, to climate change, which we did, which shows you the amount of water that was there and we, uh, we, we were going to enjoy the ride as well. However, what you see there is very bad hydrology. So obviously the water was just rushing straight off and, and down. However, what we had done was we had put our sheep in what we called sacrifice paddocks. They're now more likely to be called drought lots and there are regular currents on farms. And that is to say, as soon as it goes dry, uh, what you do is you put your sheep in a sacrifice or your cattle in a sacrifice paddock, feed them there and keep your other land ready for the rain or rain ready. Is, is another way of putting it. So we rested those paddocks and then at the end of the drought, we had feed uh, ready way before anyone else did. Now this is also now called regenerative farming and Lorraine will be talking about those things um, as, as well. So the implications for agriculture, we're a major emitter, that's a problem. We could be asked to pay for our emissions but we're also a major sink because the soil, the, car the, the soil is the largest carbon sink over which we have control and farmers control over 50% of that land mass. Farmers are the VIPs. I wrote a uh, article only the other day, farmers as rock stars. We are the rock stars of this situation, just that other people have got to recognise it. Just, um, we're the industry affected by climate change. However, we're also the ones that have got the answer to food shortages. Therefore, perfect opportunity, perfect storm. And we choose to have it as an opportunity. We are very lucky in Australia that we are able to be paid for sequestration in soils and in vegetation and to reduce emissions from livestock. It's not possible in New Zealand, for instance. So we are we are very lucky in, in order to do that. However, we've needed to sell a difficult message 
here's, a, here's the thing. These cattle, aren't the cattle the worst things? Isn't it the cattle that are, that are wrecking the place? Isn't it the cattle that we have to stop eating? Well, no, not if you're a regenerative farmer. So we choose to flip that on its head and use regenerative agriculture uh, using the cows as the best environmentalist. Now, this should be a uh, sticker on your car. However, holistic management. So that's where we started from. Holistic management, regenerative farming. They all use the animal to regenerate the land. It's not the animal, it's the way that they're managed. We need to get that message through. Okay, now about the trade. Um, so for investors, does the carbon market represent an, uh, an opportunity? It's still considered risky. So major investors, we still have an investment issue with major investors coming in and going, yes, I'll plant those trees. I'll support a, a soil carbon uh, project because it's still considered quite risky. However, we already have a regulated, rigorous, transparent, uh, internationally recognised market. In Australia, and I've said it before, an Australian carbon credit unit, an ACCU, is a financial instrument. Therefore, in order that I can assist farmers to um, understand what is involved in the trading, I have to hold, as my company has to hold, an Australian financial services license. Um, if, if your carbon project developer does not have an AFSL, then you need to ask them why not. If they are going to be teaching you how to do a project, or you need to ask that question first. Do they have an Australian financials license? Um, so the, in a recent recording, it, you know, we expect the price of carbon to go to $100 in order to reach the Paris target uh, uh, arrangements. It's currently 17. So there's a potential for a great deal of price increase over a fairly short amount of time, which would then enable the smaller cut farmers, the smaller landholders, to be more financial. Um, and we've got so many things happening in this market at the moment. Um, I, I sat in the, the CMI conference, uh, we've got the, uh, which was talking about um, exactly how we're going to meet these Paris targets, but we need the smaller farmers to come to come into, into the fold as well. So the, 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 the carbon credits, I, I, I often will say this a few times because when you're starting, it, the language is hard to you know, get hold of. So it's a tradable certificate called an ACCU. And if you take nothing away from this today, except, well, I learned today about an Australian carbon credit unit or an ACCU, you will start to have had that jargon. It represents one ton of CO2 equivalent. So literally we are proving when we have a, let's call it a soil carbon project or a tree planting project, what we're doing is we are proving that we are taking one ton of carbon dioxide out of the air and storing it in that tree or storing it back down into the soil. It's equivalent of uh, uh, one ton of carbon. We store carbon and we sell carbon dioxide. Uh, methane and nitrous oxide are reduced to CO2 for trading. So what that means is that we only have uh, one denomination. It's just one ton of CO2 that gets traded. And that currency is the same all over the world. So if I prove that I've taken one ton of CO2 out of the air here in Australia, it's they're very happy in Hong Kong to pay for that, even although I took it out of the air over here. And so we can trade between countries and between companies. In Australia, this industry is worth $2.1 billion right now. And that is due to the, coal well, it's not just the coalition policy, it goes back to the Julia Gillard era, was when, we, when, was when it started. But right now, it's worth at least $2.1 billion. 
Um, we hope that under the Paris Agreement there will be room for um, uh, for trading, and um, it's this. Emissions Reduction Fund is administered via a reverse auction. So you bid in the amount of carbon that you believe you will store over a period of time. So say I, I think I'm going to store 1,000 tonne of CO2 over the next 10 years into my soil. I can bid that into the government auction under a, 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 a forward contract. And if I win that contract, then I've got a contract to deliver that. And it's administered, our administrator is the Clean Energy Regulator or the CER. If you get into this, you will get to know the CER very well. And, uh, and, and they administer us. Um, one issue that I wanted to bring to your attention is that we are in competition with other sectors. Uh, of the economy. Other sectors, not just farmers, are allowed to trade. And, and the methods that are coming forward are for things like blue carbon, which is seaweed, uh, and also carbon capture and storage. So we are in comp potential competition as this widens, as the industry widens, we need to engage with this because we've got competitors now and they're big. These guys are big. Methods are LAW law. You, you, it's, a, it's, it's in there under legislation and the science is settled once it becomes a method. So the method rules. If there is not a method to cover what you want to do on your farm, if you wish to be paid for the carbon, you can't have a project. Uh, it, it, it gives us the measurement and verification. It's got the project specific rules for monitoring, record keeping and reporting. Those who venture into this area will start to understand that the paperwork requirements are high, but once you get through it, it's OK. Uh, and and it, the methods are consistent with relevant scientific results published in peer review. So it's got a method has gone through all of those issues prior to becoming LAW law that you can then use to put in a project. The salt carbon, this is our you know favorite method, our favorite sink is the is the soil. Um, it's most important because of the size of the sink. And um, you don't, you do not have to undertake a 100 year project. You can undertake a 25 year project. It was quite a big deal. Uh, people thought nobody would do this because you had to have a 100 year project, but you don't anymore. I can elaborate on all of these things um, at any other point for, for people who, who want to know. Um, it rewards a farmer for increasing soil cumber soil carbon under changed management systems. You cannot do business as usual. Whatever you've been doing, you cannot, you must make a change so that you increase your soil carbon. You cannot be paid for what's in the soil right at the moment. You can only be paid for increasing it. However, the code benefits include better water holding capacity and soil structure. Uh, into drought later, out of drought sooner. These are the co-benefits that, that could even be uh, valued later on. This is a visual on that. Um, Madeline, if, if I get close to time, you can just give me a five minute or whatever you, whatever you want. I've got no time um, thing. Uh, hang on, I can't see you. I can't see you. Five, 10? You've got, you've got okay. 10 minutes, Louise. Okay, great. So this is just a visual of the benefits. Uh, if you increase your soil carbon, less erosion, improved soil structure, all of these things. Now, all of these are co-benefits and these co-benefits should also be um, valued going forward. Okay, this is a very simple 
this is a this is a very simple um, also a visual on your risk and return calculator. So what you're looking at to, to make the decision as to whether or not this will be something that you will be interested in, the price per tonne, your tonnes per hectare, how many hectares, uh, you, you know, and against that is the cost of land management, the cost of baselining, that is in the soil carbon space, you must test your soil originally, how much carbon is in there right at the moment, because you're going to be paid for the increase, not what is there at the moment. The middleman costs could include um, aggregation, it could include um, the share for the carbon project developer partner, which is what I am. How long is your contract and your permanence liability? 25 years, 100 years. So what would you like to do on your land to store carbon and be and be issued with these uh, with these credits? This is a this is what you can be paid for. What there are methods approved for land based for for your land based efforts. There are other methods. Keep in mind there are other methods. You can store the carbon in the soil. You can ex protect or maintain the existing existing forest, but that needs a clearing permit. Planting seeds or seedlings is the environmental plantings. It's a good one for aggregation and it's a, a good one you know, for smaller farmers to get together. Relatively easy, this one, relatively easy. Plantation, if you're thinking of a plantation, you can now be paid for carbon in a plantation or you can let degraded land revert to native forests. Unfortunately, at the price of carbon at the moment, this one, the degraded land revert to native forests, requires a large area, and I'm talking about 5,000 hectares. This is just a very quick look at the other things that you can do. Of these, the most important other one is to reduce methane from cattle. There are, there are lots of work going on at the moment to try and improve the method that's available to be able to be paid to reduce methane in, in your cattle. Again, at the moment, that method requires a large herd, all a large herd, 5,000, 10,000 head, but you can aggregate, you can join together with others. And here's a visual of what the uh, uh, the market looks uh, looks like. So individual farmers can join together, or if you're one big farmer, you don't need to join together. But smaller farmers under, you know, the Western LLS may have the opportunity to join together. The LLS could be the aggregator. I'm, I've been in in meetings with the New South Wales uh, uh, Net Zero, what's it called? Um, Net Zero Plan, and they are trying to operationalise how this can work using LLS, using land care, so that we can uh, operationalise these smaller farmers under an aggregator. The database is just all of your information, all of the records that you have to keep when you're doing this. Everything has to be audited and you'll be audited under your method. So your method feeds into what the auditor needs to do. And then what you come out with, we've made it soil carbon uh, pool of soil carbon units. That could be tree carbon. It could be reduced methane. It could be any, any pool. You can never sell all of your carbon. There's always a buffer pool. Uh, it's called risk of reversal. It's a detail. And then you've got the choice. This group of farmers could choose to go through a retail market. That would be where you set up a website, for instance, and you offered, uh, you know, Western Sydney LLS credits and you give it a fabulous name and, and you would set up a website. Or or you go through to the corporate market, which has, you know, like brokers and exchanges. And I sell through brokers sometimes. 
Um, this could also be called um, the government market over here as well. Um, so just very quickly, because this is um, the detailed area. So it's a multi-step process. Uh, I believe Lorraine might be just going through this uh, system at the moment. Number one to remember, you cannot start to change your management. You cannot start to plant the trees if you want to be paid until you are registered. You must be registered. So, um, the, and there's some paperwork uh, in, in regards to that. Um, under soil carbon, you would baseline your soil carbon. Once, you pro once you, your project is registered, then you undertake the activity. When soil carbon increase is anticipated, retest the soil. If the increase is realised, you need to write an offsets report and you need to have it audited. Once that is done and you've passed that, that point, your ACCUs are issued into your ENRU account, another piece of jar jargon, which is your Australian National Registry of Emission Units account. <laughs> there is a lot of jargon, there's, there's, but it's, it's a new industry, so there's new jargon. Um, then you can decide, would you like to bid into the auction if desired to sell to the government? or sell to the secondary market. Soil carbon is a particular one because its volume is likely to be smaller. So when you're doing a, a larger project, you might be wanting to sell 40,000 tonnes, for instance. But for a soil carbon project, you might only want to, uh, want to sell 1,000. So you would tend to go for a, um, uh, not the government market. The government market is more of the commodity market. So you might try to find a higher buyer, a buyer at a higher price. Simples, you see, it's simples, but the devil is in the detail and I, I can go into detail. Also on my website, on the Carbon Farmers of Australia website, I have three recent one hour webinars where I do go through all of this in quite a lot of detail. So do go there and, and you know, flip through that as well. So um, to, I'll just quickly show you the, the results of the government reverse auction so far. How did we get to a $2.1 billion industry? Um, and here's a good thing, Woodside, a little tiny company called Woodside, recently acquired Select Carbon. They had 24 projects in Western Australia. So Woodside is now effectively saying we will offset our emissions via a, co a company that we've bought called Select Carbon, who've got 24. Now, that's the big industry, the big end of town coming into it. But I'd like to make sure that the smaller companies and the smaller areas are also um, as, as important. Um, and, and the way you do it, you can join together in an aggregation. And as I said, New South Wales DPI is actively, is actively finding ways that people can, can join in this. So this is the 11th auction. This was the one that just went. Uh, so contract, and this is all on the Clean Energy Regulator site. You need to start to get familiar with the Clean Ed Energy Regulator. And the so you just Google it and it's got everything on it. And you get, uh, uh, yes. I'll yes. give you one, can you go for one more minute? Is that okay? Yep, yep. Thanks. Hang on, let me just find the, white, the right one of these. Um, 11th auction, I just want to show you the overall. Okay, so right now, last last one. So the under the government under the government reverse auction, one hundred and thirty six million tons has been yes. Yes, I've got more feedback again. <laughs> okay, I just want to show you. I just, I just wanted to show you that vegetation is the largest 
the largest amount of emissions reduction that has been committed under the government's reverse auction. Everything else pales into in insignificance. So this is vegetation and, and agriculture is 15 million tonnes. That's where the soil carbon sit, sits. 502 projects under, uh, under contract. All good. Okay, thank you, Louisa. Thanks, Louisa, very much. So there'll be time at the end to ask questions directly to Louisa through the chat function, so keep those coming. And now I'm going to introduce Lorraine. I might just keep you on mute, Lorraine, until I introduce you, just to, in case we, so we can avoid any feedback. Um, so Lorraine Gordon is the founder of the National Regenerative Agricultural Alliance based in Southern Cross University. And Lorraine is also the Director of Strategic Projects at Southern Cross Uni and Associate Director of the University's Centre for Organic Research. Lorraine acts as a conduit between industry and research, delivering sustainable and regenerative agriculture solutions nationally. And Lorraine is also a carbon farmer and holistic beef cattle trader in New England tablelands of New South Wales. So if you can please share your presentation, which you're already doing, that's fantastic, Lorraine. And I'll get your video up and send you live. Okay. Okay, Madeline, am I, uh, am I unmuted now? You are. Fantastic. Can everybody see my slides okay? Yes. Just checking in that it's all, can you see the slides, Madeline? The slides are good. Thanks, Lorraine. Great. Okay. Um, good morning, everyone. And Louisa, that was a great gig given. I can imagine the feedback that was going on in your head trying to give that presentation. So um, well done. It actually came across some very interesting information there. Look, um, as Madeline has mentioned, I do wear a few hats. And I'm very much one that um, I'm, I'm located in a university, but I am a serious large farmer up at Ebor. And when I stepped into this carbon farming game, if I was going to be talking about carbon farming from an academic level or um, through a university or, or sharing information with other farmers, I personally felt I really had to walk that journey myself. Um, and that is exactly what I've done. I guess you could say I've put my money where my mouth is. I am spending some significant money um, to go down this path. Um, and so I'm very open to share my experience um, with other farmers. No doubt I will make mistakes along that, along that path. That's, that's just part of it. Um, but I, I certainly want to be able to share um, that journey with others. So um, as Madeline has alluded to, um, I am Director of Strategic Projects at Southern Cross University. I head up the Regenerative Agriculture Alliance for Australia and the Farming Together program. I am also a cattle fattener um, up at Ebor in northern New South Wales and carbon farmer. I'd like to actually reverse that and say I'm a carbon farmer um, that uses cattle fattening to build carbon. Um, so I'm actually looking to do my first trade in about three years. Uh, and, and the reason for that, it's usually three to five years, is that I'm actually located at an altitude of 1500 metres above sea level. And in a normal season, whatever the hell that looks like, um, we would have experienced around 2000 millimetres of rainfall. It is rich red basalt country and referred to as the New England Snowies because of uh, the temperature ranges and the high rainfall. And the temperature ranges can range from minus 10 to around 27 degrees. So it's, a, it's quite a cool climate. So what we normally do is we'll buy in steers at around 250 um, kgs and we hold them for around eight to 12 months, turning them off anywhere between 450 and 600 kilograms. 
um, aiming for the MSA grass fed premium market. So what I've implemented um, before I get into the nooks and crannies of carbon farming, what um, we are implementing on our farm for carbon farming is number one, time controlled grazing or holistic management. Now, whilst I've been doing holistic management for some 27 years, so I've been on a very long regenerative journey, um, I still need to bring something new to the mix, which Louisa did allude to. So I'll talk a bit more about that. The other thing I will be doing on, on the farm is correcting mineral deficiencies based on soil testing um, rather than using inorganic fertilisers. Now, both of those things we have already been doing for a long time, but I need to do them somewhat differently for them to be registered as carbon farming um, methods. So with our holistic farming, basically we will be increasing our stocking numbers and reducing the size of our paddocks. So we're increasing stock density. So I aim to triple my carrying capacity on this farm with carbon farming, which is a different method than what I have had before. So I will be decreasing the size of my paddocks and moving those cattle quicker than what we have in the past. And that is an accepted methodology at this stage. The other thing we will be doing is adding a mineral that we've never added to the farm before, which will be probably gypsum. So we've always limed and corrected different mineral deficiencies, but gypsum is one we have not used to date. The third thing we'll be doing, which we have never done before, is um, multi-species pasture um, cropping. So this, and I can talk about these practices, but these are all regenerative agricultural practices. I will stress that. And um, so we'll be actually doing those three things, adding lots of different species into the mix with our pasture, multi-species pasture cropping, which actually, um, I guess, boosts the whole system, encourages that um, fast photosynthesis and therefore carbon sequestration, speeds up the whole process. So they're the three methodologies that we have chosen for our farm. And I'm going to speak mostly about what we're doing and what we plan to do. So let's go to the next slide. These are just some pretty pictures, really, um, of what all of that means. So for those that don't know, you know, we're going to be using composting as well. I didn't mention that, but composting across a large area. So, you know, we do have um, a couple of thousand hectares up at Ebor, and uh, so composting a, across a large area is quite significant. There's the different types of holistic grazing. You've got time control grazing. Some might remember the cell grazing and holistic grazing itself. Slight subtleties between them. I'm not going to go into that today, but there's some of the practices that we're using. And then we've got the multi-species pasture cropping. So it's some of the steps involved with carbon farming. So if you're starting from scratch, you know, what happens? Where do you start? Where do you hop on this, um, this train called uh, carbon farming? The first thing that happens is you've actually got to have a carbon ready initial farm assessment and appraisal. So someone, whoever you choose as your advisor in this space will come on and actually assess whether you and your farm stack up to go down this path. And so, there is a mindset in this. You've got to be open to new practices and you've actually got to do what you're told once you sign up for it. So not everybody is going to be able to do that. And so that carbon ready farm assessment also includes ascertaining whether the farmer is going to be able to stick to what they say they're going to do. You then need to complete a carbon management plan. And that plan is not a farm plan, it's a plan to increase soil carbon. So how are you going to do it? You then register the farm as a project with the federal government. That is a lengthy, lengthy process. And that is where you will find there is all, a ton of paperwork involved. You then consider entering pro the project into the competitive ERF auction process for carbon contracts to sell ACUs, as Louise has already mentioned what they are, to the federal government within 10 years. And I say consider, I'll talk about that a little bit later on. 
you can then, the next step after that is to complete your baseline documentation to establish the history of previous practice. So you have to baseline, you have to actually have a starting point to move forward. And um, coming off the back of a previous drought is probably a pretty good time in history to do that because our, our soils are quite depleted um, and quite stressed from that process. So what happens is you do your baseline soil testing and there's an audit. And the, re the government requires three testing uh, regimes spaced apart in total. And that includes mapping, recording, analysis and record keeping. You have to review your management plan annually. And then these, you have external independent audits undertaken with, like I said, those three testing regimes. And then the payment to the farmer usually happens within three to five years from the sale of your accus to either the government or to corporates or to both. And I can talk a little bit more about that further on. So when we look at the options for making money out of this game called carbon farming, um, there are a number of options. And if you take nothing away today, understand that you do not have to sell your carbon at all. You don't have to sell your carbon to the government. There, are, there is more money to be made in selling your carbon uh, to the corporates, to the corporate world. So there are options. Um, what there isn't an option about is registering. So if you don't register with the government, then you can't do things retrospectively and go back and say, oh, I didn't realise I needed to register and I've built all of this carbon, can I now register? No, you can't. So if you're planning to go down this path, you don't have to think about who you're going to sell it to at this stage, but you do need to register. So register the project with, project with the federal government. Um, register and include, this is the second option, an ERF contract to get paid at the government price for any increases. So that's an option. Include a secondary market contract. Example, a corporate contract. You might decide to sell some to the government and some to a corporate market in addition to the government's contract. And that will increase the value of your carbon payment. You can sell your accus to specific buyers with a full history of flora and fauna on the farm, including any rare and endangered species. Now, this is almost what I call carbon stacking. You could be certified carbon neutral farmer, good marketing opportunity and more attractive to the buyer, hence higher price can be received. So for instance, if you were also to have a carbon farming project, a soil carbon farming project, and also be doing biodiversity credits and offsets, you're starting to have a really good story to tell to a corporate customer that may want to buy your carbon because they can advertise that in their elevator or in their shopping center or wherever they might be to say, here's how we offset our footprint. Look at this beautiful farm. They, they've got biodiversity happening. They've got carbon farming happening. And so that's almost carbon stacking. So you're using all these market mechanisms to sell a fantastic story about your farm. And there's more and more of them coming. So that's what we call selling your products which are carbon plus rather than just carbon neutral by telling the biodiversity story as well, you could gain a higher price, including those biodiversity credits and offsets. You don't have to do that and you may not want to do that, but it's just another option. You could have no contracts in place for now and sell on the spot market at some point in the future when, when credits become available. To me, that is a safer option right now. Um, that's probably, I'm not gonna put any contracts in place right now because I know that carbon is go only going in one direction as far as the price that's paid and that is up. So I don't wanna lock myself into a price now, say it was a price of $15 something with the, the government when in five years time, it could be worth twice as much. So I'm not prepared to do that. I'm gonna register and I will decide at the time whether I choose to sell my carbon or not sell my carbon. And in that way, because I haven't locked in any contracts, if for some reason I didn't build carbon, I'm not locked into a contract having to pay out to them. 
So that's another thing. You need to be very wary of what you sign and what you say you will do in the future as far as trading carbon. So I'm going to put a disclaimer on this, this table or uh, this particular calculation I've done, and it's very hard, I understand, for everybody to get their head around this, but it is an example only. It's an example based on a 400 hectare project um, Louisa touched on the role of aggregators for small farms. It is an important role they play, but you don't have to have an aggregator. If, as um, I have decided to do with my, my family, uh, you decide to go it alone, so I'm actually going to be a standalone project, you must have a minimum of 400 hectares, I believe, for this to, to pay off. Uh, anything smaller than that, then it's it, the costs, you know, the risk are just that much higher. Um, and that's when you need to aggregate with other farms and that's what aggregators do. So here's an example of 400 hectare um, property used for the project. And that's removing woodlands, buildings, dams and riparian areas. Understand you can only do this in reasonably opened areas. They can have, of course, you know, trees on the landscape, but you basically the test is, can you get a tractor around it? Um, because you need to be able to do the soil testing. You need to be able to get the equipment on there to be able to measure um, at those points. So uh, yeah, you need to remove all of those other things. So you need sort of um, open woodland or open areas of around 400 hectares to go alone. And so there's a calculation aiming for about 1% increase in soil organic carbon based on the uh, top 30 centimetres. When we do these tests, um, we aim to go down up to 1.5 metres uh, because the great thing about um, soil uh, carbon sequestration is that it is endless how much you can sequester and it keeps going down into the soil profile. So if you find um, you're only measuring the top, you're actually doing yourself an, a, a disjustice because there is um, a lot of carbon to be uh, to be stored in the soil and you should be able to go as deep as you can get. In our country, we hit basalt rock, so that's challenging, but yeah, the deeper the better. So moving on with this, 400 hectares, you're looking at about, with a 1% soil carbon increase, soil organic carbon increase, 49,600 acus, acus. So if you're assuming an average price, we've just plucked a figure of $17. Like we said, the government's um, nearly hitting 16 at the moment, 843,200. That would be now. That would be if you sold around this time. In five years, that price may go to $25 per acu. Then you're looking at 1.24 million. If that price goes to 30, or if you're lucky enough to get a contract at $30 per acu, you're looking at nearly 1.5 million. And there's my little happy days, smiley emoji. Okay, and this is where I bring in my little quick discussion. I mean, I could do a whole nother thing on regenerative agriculture and what role that plays and what it is. Um, and I will touch on some of the profitability other than trading carbon that comes out of this. But I'll tell you what won't build soil carbon, um, and this is scientific fact. Paddocks of bare soil with lack of ground cover. Monocrops, mon monocrops, monocrops that lack biodiversity. Spraying out paddocks prior to sowing new pastures or crops, which is gonna kill all your microorganisms, your microeyes or fungi in the soil, the connections that go on in the whole of the life forms down there under the ground. Set stocking, overuse of synthetic chemicals, fertilizers and pesticides, and over tillage and disturbance of the soil. Because tillage is actually releasing more carbon into the atmosphere. What we're actually trying to do is to take it from the atmosphere, the CO2, and shove it back in the ground. So that's what doesn't build soil carbon. That's what doesn't constitute regenerative agriculture. So um, before I move on to some of the research stuff, I just want to look at 
I guess, the co-benefits or the other areas of profit profitability. First of all, when you go down this path, let's just forget that you're going to trade at all. Building carbon in your soil um, and being a carbon farmer is actually going to increase your bottom line. It actually increase, increases the profitability of your farm. Firstly, you have less overheads and variable costs because you're not using that, you're not on that spiral of continual inputs of synthetic fertilizers and applications. You're gonna retain more water in the soil because you've got ground cover and you build carbon absorbs moisture, absorbs water. So the more carbon, the more that whatever rain comes out of the sky, whatever moisture comes out is gonna be captured into your soil profile. You're gonna have more consistent returns because again, you're not on that spiral. You're actually on a planned way forward to build carbon in the soil and build resilience into your landscapes. So you're not gonna get the ebbs and flows. Um, and this is actually part, we talk about research, this is actually part of my research. So um, part of my PhD is around comparing practices, farming practices of conventional farmers with regenerative farmers. And whilst some of these high input, high performing top 20% farmers, um, certainly in one year, their cost of production might um, be X and their profits might be Y. And they will be often, they will put on two and a half kilos a day when I can, or I'm only putting on two as an example, because their inputs are so high. They are pumping that system with nitrogen. So their use of NPK is high. I call them my urea kings, they're my neighbors. I love them to bits, um, but wait until a drought hits. So they'll outstrip me in any good year, of course. Um, but when the drought came, their pastures, which were monocrops of, of the latest ryegrass species, just disintegrated. They just went. Whereas my mixed pastures, uh, my perennial mixed pastures of native, a mixture of native and improved, held the system together. And whatever moisture was in the air or dropped out of the air was held on my landscape. It didn't run off into the river systems or run off to the neighbours next door or worse, be blown away to, New Ze to the New Zealand Alps, like what we saw in some of the central western areas of New South Wales. So it's in those tough drought years that the differences in those farming practices become real and very, very ob obvious. I could have driven around New South Wales and I could have looked into the paddocks of those farms and told you exactly what farming practices they were using and whether they were a holistic or not. Um, so that's a, a very important point when you look at profitability over a period of time, those consistent returns. Clearly, there's, um, there's room to make money through carbon trading, um, but it's not, it's not the only thing, only reason that you would go down this path. Consumers, now, we all know consumers are king. So what is going to happen and is happening more and more in the future is they're going to become quite educated in this space and they're actually going to buy their produce and their food based on how that food was produced, where it was produced, who produced it, what methods did they use, were the animals raised in a humane manner, was the environment affected at all in any way. Um, so consumers already can get that sort of information. But this in big data land will increase increasingly happen and they will choose with their feet and they will pay premiums for products that are produced that look after the environment and are humane to the animals that are in that environment. So, you know, watch this space because it is a real trigger for moving into the carbon farming space. Um, we found on our farm that unlike some of the conventional big time cattle farmers, we had less dark cutters. Now, a lot of people don't know what dark cutters are, but when you actually go to, um, when your animals are killed at the abattoir, it's basically bruising. And bruising is usually caused from stress. Now, there's a lot of reasons for stress. It could be because there was no tree cover in the, 
in the paddock and the animals were cold and therefore their muscles shrinked up and expanded and shrunk and expanded and shrunk. It could be bad handling in the cattle yards. Um, it could be bad trucking practices. There's a whole heap of reasons for what we call dark cutters in cattle, but you also lose a lot of money if that's what happens when you um, send them to the abattoir. So uh, to avoid that, regenerative practices uh, when it comes to livestock is essential. And basically it is more profitable because you're hopping off that spiral of, of continuous inputs and you're actually more engaged with your landscape and managing the landscape in a holistic manner. Um, so we're doing a lot of research at Southern Cross University at the moment in regenerative agriculture. Um, Multi-species pasture cropping is a really interesting area and some of uh, what we're finding is it's not always about which species, there's no magic fix here, it's about diversity and biodiversity and throwing lots of species at a system with those deep tap roots, um, the deep tillage type plants like your tillage radishes and so forth, your vetch um, and your legumes and putting that into, sowing it into the pasture so you don't lose any ground cover, you've always got ground cover and it's boosting the whole system. So that's a very interesting area of research currently being undertaken at SCU. Uh, here's my piece of research on the comparisons with conventional and um, regenerative systems. I'm doing that from a triple bottom line perspective. So not only do I look at the profitability or the economics, I'm looking at the effect on the environment and I'm comparing neighbour on neighbour when I do this. So same climatic conditions, same rainfall, same soil types. And I'm also looking at the social impl implications for the community and the families of, on which these properties um, are housing. So how the families stack up mentally and physically um, according to the various farming systems that they, they use. So it's a very interesting piece of research. It's a longitudinal study. So it started in 2016 um, and we're now collating data over that four year period, which is looking very interesting. So uh, watch that space. Um, obviously, yes, carbon farming and carbon sequestration. Um, that's definitely a big area for us. Some closing tips um, when it comes to carbon farming, and I'm sure Louisa will back me on this. One must baseline where you are at. Um, don't go into this unless you do that. You have to baseline, you have to register with the government, but you don't have to start trading. You don't even need to get your head around that stuff right now. Just make sure you register so that in the future, if you have found that you actually have built carbon in your soil, then you can choose to actually sell some of that carbon. Um, so it just sets you up really well into the future. I mentioned carbon prices are only going in one direction and that is up. So prices range right now from $15 with the government, like we've seen, $30 with corporates, to $45 in Korea. So there's already this huge span of price range that you can tap into. There are both government and corporate markets, we've mentioned that, and you can only do this by undertaking regenerative practices, which also increase your triple bottom line, that is economically, socially and environmentally in a changing climate. And as I've mentioned, research is underway in the types of practices that build carbon and methodologies. So I'll end my slideshow because I don't know where I'm up to in um, how much time we've got, uh, but I can talk further if we need to or take questions or I know we're going to have a Q&A and we're probably already somewhat out of time. Thanks, Thanks Lorraine. Lorraine. Yeah, that's yeah, that's spot on. on 30 minutes, so that's great. Thank you. Now I'd like to introduce Kara Stitzlein. Kara is a research scientist at CSIRO based in Hobart. Kara supports the Digiscape Future Science platform with her research in human factors and user experience. And it's Kara's strength in human-centered design that she brought to the development of Look See, a tool that she's about to show us today. So I'm gonna hand over to Kara now. I'll mute myself.
Cara, we can't hear you. You're not muted, so I think you need to check your microphone. It was working before. No. Is that coming through any better ah, for you? That's coming now. Great. I think it must have gone to sleep. Over Hopefully. to you, Cara. Okay. And you can just make your presentation full screen. That'll be great. Yes, I sure will. All right, it should be full screen now. And look, just give me a holler if something isn't looking right or sounding right, okay? So thanks very much for having me along today. I would just like to start with a really brief acknowledgement of country. Um, I'm joining from Hobart today, and so I'd like to recognize the Muwanina people and pay my respects to the Palawa people who are the continuing custodians of the land from which I'm joining. I pay my respects to their elders past, present, and forthcoming. What I'll be talking about briefly today is giving you a run through through a little digital tool that we call Looksee, which we just see as a way to start the conversation for what your options are for carbon farming, specifically within that emissions reduction fund or the climate solutions fund that's been already mentioned by the earlier presenters. I'll be using some of the same terms that are really important to understand if you're interested in carbon farming as a way to diversify the productivity of your farming business, terms like the Emissions Reduction Fund, methods, and the ACU or the Australian Carbon Credit Unit. Oh. Okay. Just a word about how this tool came about being developed. It hasn't followed a typical path of digital development. It's involved a lot of farmers, a lot of carbon farming project advisors and managers, as well as some of the stakeholders in this very complex carbon farming space. All of these different folks have had a role to play in the development of the product that you're going to see. In terms of what's running on the back end of the application, or in terms of the science that is behind the tool that you're not going to be able to see on the screens. We use different data sources, including an emissions factor database and a database called FullCam, which is something that Australia uses to do their carbon accounts. So it accounts for the whole of the greenhouse gas collective. <clears throat> we also use data from the Soil and Landscape Grid of Australia to make the estimates of what might be gained from different carbon farming projects. So why would you use a tool like Looksee? Well, you would use it to see what of the current approved projects, those around vegetation and agriculture, are feasible with how your land is currently being managed. You would use the tool to see some rough and ready estimates of what sort of carbon credit units are possible with a 25 year project, as well as to learn about what those different projects involve and what kind of co-benefits are associated with the changes that are required in your carbon farming project. You might want to use Looksee as a free way to start investigating the opportunity and to get some real basic material that then you could take to someone if you wanted to take that next step to get that assessment, to get help with that project registration. And I've got the link to the tool just on that slide there look-c.farm. How do you use Looksee? It's really pretty simple, but I'll walk you through it today. What you'll do is just select the reason that you want to investigate by selecting a couple of points on a map. You'll answer a few questions about how the land's currently being used, and then boom, you get a sort of discovery screen, and you'll be able to click on those cards and learn more about the method that you want to learn about. After you've gone through the process of using the tool, you can save and export as a PDF. You can also contact others for more information about what's involved, and you'd be able to do that through a sort of next steps FAQ page that's on the app. So what I'll run through here are just a few screenshots so you'll know what to expect when you're using the app. <clears throat> Excuse me. You'll have an introductory page, and when you hit the Explore Options button, that's when you'll come to the interactive map where you'll scroll down, identify that area you want to investigate, 
and then answer a few very straightforward questions about how that land's currently being used. It's at this point that I want to re-emphasize that the tool is free and that we are not collecting the information that you're entering on this tool. We've made that decision quite deliberately because we're really not interested in collecting farm data. We're interested in this project of just helping others see what sort of opportunities are out there as a way to promote activity within this carbon market. After you answer those questions, you'll see a screen where a couple of interactive cards pop up. By cards, I simply mean these long rectangles. Within each rectangle, you've got the name of the project type or method. You've got uh, some colored boxes indicating the different co-benefits that are associated with the activity that you would undertake as part of that project. And then at the bottom, we've got this estimate of what level of ACUS might be possible on both a per hectare per year basis, as well as over the 25 years of the project. When you click on the card, it opens up to what you see on the right hand side of the screen, which is a bit more information about the project, a direct link to the tool on the Clean Energy Regulators website, and then a detailed description of what we mean by those different co-benefits. Here are just some bigger pictures to show what sorts of information you can obtain through using the tool. And look, this is really just to give you a sense of whether these projects are feasible given where you're located in Australia and how the land's being used so far. We find that the co-benefits tab is really quite useful because some people are interested in just learning about these other benefits associated with the practices that they're willing to start using on different types of land. All right, so I was given two use cases to walk through. The first one I'll go quite quickly through. This was from Western Sydney Uni. So on the left side is the picture of the campus provided to me. And on the right side of the screen, you can see what that looks like within the app, where I basically made my best guess about the area of land that might be used for a carbon farming project. I was given a little bit of information about how the land was currently being used. So it used to be used as pasture. There'd been no renovation, no practice of uh, synthetic, or I'm sorry, no practice of lime, but prior use of some synthetic fertilizer and prior use of irrigation. That's the basic information that the tool needs to start to filter out what the irrelevant project types are and then to provide those estimates, again, based on those back-end science components that I described earlier. Here's a blown up shot of what the tool produced for that investigation of the uni farm. The ones that showed the highest annual ACUs per hectare per year were associated with the vegetation methods. I also ran it through the beef herd management more because I was just quite curious to see uh, what might it yield because the beef herd management is one of the newer modules that we've added to the tool. Just some more examples of what that information looks like when you pop open the card. And here's an example of that module for beef herd management. It's already been mentioned that we really do need at scale to make this method work. So we really do need large herd sizes. Uh, what we do with this module is we ask for just a couple of pieces of information about the distribution of different types of animals and their ages. And then we leave it to you to give an expectation of what the efficiency of the live weight gain might be. Based on those minimal outputs, then we can give you an estimate of ACUs under that type of project. Okay, the second example was around Sancho's hole. Now, what I'm going to try and do is break out of that PowerPoint and just run through this rather quickly. So again, you can see what it's going to look like and just how easy it is to use the tool to get that first indication of what might be possible. I agree to enter the tool. I come into the map and I'm going to use my search bar and put in Mount David. All right, so it gets me there because I've already kind of kind of teased it along because I tried this earlier today. And I use those pluses and minuses to zoom in and out. And hopefully that goes OK for you on the webinar. And it's um, it's streaming quite all right. Now, I also know that the property that I'm looking for was kind of around this intersection of Mount David. And there it is, Campbell's River Road. 
So I do a little bit of fooling around. And of course, if you're familiar with the landscape, this is going to be no, no difficulty for you at all. And then again, what I did is I selected the area tool and I just put my cursor roughly around that area that I want to investigate. I close it off, it turns color. That lets me know that I've completed a shape that can be investigated. It gives me my selected area size, which was just over 300 hectares. And here are those filtering questions that I need to answer about prior production system and just some of the land management to date. I fill those out, I hit next, and without waiting for too long, this is my discovery table. Now, the project types up at top. This has to do with a model based soil carbon method, quite different and quite conservative in its estimates compared to the soil carbon method that's been talked about earlier. If I continue to scroll down, I see that here's where I have some higher estimates, estimates that might be worth looking into a bit further. The main one here being the reforestation by environmental or Mali plantings. It's giving me a 27 a 27 ACU estimate per hectare per year. So over 300 hectares or even a larger property, you can start to do the math to see how this might be something profitable for your, your business strategy going forward. If I want to learn a little bit more, I click on the, type, the, the title of that project. Here's where I get the basic information as well as a link to the emissions reduction fund page. It's also here that I can save as a PDF so I can take this information to an advisor or a project manager. And I've got the two tabs up here on my, my clickout screen, one with the details, the other with the co-benefits. Again, these co-benefits are just those other benefits that are associated with making the land use change. We've got a couple of different categories, a couple of really basic descriptions, and then just a general sense of how much those co-benefits are associated with making changes like the environmental plannings. I'm going to click back to my presentation now. Oh, and I will make that a bit bigger. Well, I didn't want to go back to the beginning, but if you bear with me, let's go back to our second case, Sancho's Hill, just southeast of Mount David. You can see where I've selected the polygon. It gives me these sorts of options. I can go into more detail to learn a little bit more. And here I've got just a screenshot of the other new module that we've added to the tool. And this is that measurement based soil carbon method. Um, the difference here or the, what has to be done is you've got to add a bit more information. We provide you with the distribution down below based on what we know of the soil carbon levels in that land based on the um, based on the national soils grid. If you've already done a baseline measurement of your soil carbon, you can actually change based on this box here from what we've already think is kind of a pretty average or in that middle part of the distribution. Also, if you have an indication of how much more soil carbon you think might be possible, you can put it in the, the field here and it'll move you around and it'll give you an updated estimate. Again, this is a tool just to give you a sense of what might be possible. And we've put some things in place within the tool to keep you from going outside of what might be a feasible soil carbon level for the area of Australia that you're within. Uh, so this just gives a slide that tells you what was associated with that second use case where we've got the most profitable method being the reforestation method with about a 26 estimate per hectare per year. And we can see that we've got some co-benefits associated with that land use change, profitability around diversifying our business portfolio, increased soil stability, which will contribute to our long-term resilience, and the, the possibility of increased biodiversity, and of course, climate adaptivity. So just to sum up, we've come to this tool through a lot of co-design, working between scientists and stakeholders in the area. The notion behind the tool is to support just that first step of seeing whether carbon farming is an option for you and your farming business. And it's also a way just to encourage the use of digital 
there is so much technology being pushed on us in every aspect of our life, and it's been really helpful to be part of a process where the conversation can just start around a little piece of tech instead of the tech driving the conversation. I just want to give a shout that this is a, a very multidisciplinary team and a little bit more information on the bottom there if you'd like to know more about this project or if you would like to link to the tool yourself. I'm happy to have these, these slides shared. I think I've also provided a flyer that just runs through some of that basic information with what the tool is based on and why you would want to use it in this situation. That's all for me. I'm going to start stop sharing the screen now. Great, thank you very much, Cara. That was a really good overview of the tool. And um, you did provide me with a flyer, which I will email out along with a um, link to the recording of this session. So some questions have been coming through and Maya in the background has been collecting them and keeping track of them. So what we'll do is I'll hand over to Ange and um, she'll start addressing the questions. Hi everyone, Angela Mayer here from Greater Sydney Local Land Services. Thanks everyone for posting your questions. Um, I, might, I might just go through in order of speaker. So um, Louisa, a question from Anonymous was posted of, what if you don't meet the target you set? Um, and if I could just ask the presenters to just, um, if you can, leave your answers as brief as possible because we've probably got about 20 questions to go through. So um, we may not have time to answer all of them. Okay, very quickly, um, if you're doing a soil carbon project uh, uh, and when you're registering, you do have to put what's called a forward abatement estimate in, into your um, into your registration, which is your estimate of what you're going to do. And you can do make decisions like that before you go to registration using you know, some of the things we've spoken about today. Um, if you have a, um, a two, two ways that you don't have to deliver. Number one, um, Lorraine was talking about the spot market. That is, you get your ACCUs issued into your ANRU account. You don't owe them to um, any anyone else. Or if you don't, what you're saying is if you don't deliver, then you simply um, tell the, the clean energy regulator that either you want to stop the project or you have a later de delivery. You only have to report between one and five years. So if you don't do anything in the first three years, you've still got two more years uh, under which you could increase your soil carbon um, and you know make that, make that delivery. Um, if you've got an optional contract with the government and you can't deliver, that optional contract uh, falls uh, falls down and you do not have to deliver. The only the only thing that you're stuck into is if you get a government contract that is not an optional contract. Then you've whatever you've said you're going to deliver and you've got the contract to deliver it, then you must deliver it. Over. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Louisa. Um, one more. I'll choose one more question from your section. Um, so what is the commercial relationship between project developers and farmers? How does the farmer pay the developer and how much? And that was posted by Edward. Okay, Edward, uh, look, various different things. What you do is you go to my um, website, Carbon Farmers of Australia, and you look up the thing that says questions to ask your project developer. And so, you know, you ask them, you know, how do I get paid? Um, how do you, you get paid? Uh, you know, is there a fixed contract? Is there a fixed price? Um, uh, Lorraine ha has uh, made some decisions with um, a, a, a certain group or, or you know, a, a company um, because she's decided to go on the spot market. Uh, there are, you, you know, the questions there would be, you know, how am I going to sell them when I get them in my hands? Who, who knows where the buyers are? So, you know, what you need to do is some more research on that and ask different project developers, and I'm happy to be, uh, you know, to set out the way I do it, if anybody wants to know. Um, and, and But on my site, there's actually an area where you can go, what questions should you ask? And, and I'm happy to elaborate on them as well. Thank you. Great, thanks for that. Um, now, we've had a couple of questions. Um, I'm not sure if um, which of the presenters would be able to answer this, but couple of questions regarding um, 
farming, carbon farming on smaller properties. So um, one question was, how can small peri-urban farmers and holdings benefit mm. from these developments financially on top of social and environmental apart from aggregation? And another question was asked if, um, would it be relevant for a small farm, for example, 16 hectares that mm. we've moved on to just over a year ago and wanting to improve? Those questions were from Eric and from uh, David. Not sure if Lorraine or Louisa would be the oh, best I, persons to I, answer. This is probably a good one for Louisa, to be honest, but just before we move off the previous question, I just wanted to add a little something to that. In my case, there's two ways to go. When you, you did, just before we move on to this new question, you know, how does the farmer pay the project developer? There's basically two, two ways to go here. You will find a lot of aggregators will pay for everything for you up front and take a very large cut of your carbon credits when you go to trade. That's one way to do it. So it doesn't cost the farmer too much. You know, they'll even pay for your baselining and all of this stuff. They'll um, make it quite cheap for you to get into the carbon mark, into the into carbon farming and trading. Um, that's one way. But then down the track, you're going to you could be losing up to 30% of your profits to that aggregating company. The other way you can go about it, which is the way I chose to go about it, was to actually take on some of this risk myself to pay upfront for all of the different things I need to do. So um, the auditing, the baselining, the soil testing, pay for my consultant's time that they spend on my property advising me. I paid those things up front. I budgeted for that, but I actually share very little of the profit when I go to trade at the other end. So there's the, you know, and in between that, there's all sorts of scenarios. So just keep that in mind. If an aggregator comes along to you or a consultant says, you know, I oh, will pay for all of that and we'll sort all of that, be aware nothing comes for free. So they will be locking you into a contract at some stage down there so they can get paid for their time they've spent with you and they will be taking a pretty good chunk of your profits. Um, that is quite comfortable for a lot of people and that is definitely a choice you need to make. Um, but yeah, you do have the other way where you can actually just pay for these services up front. And then I'm going to pass that one to Louisa because I think these small property aggregations um, yeah, well, you you have to have an aggregator to do it, but that's my comment and I'll leave it to Louisa to answer that one. Yeah, and we could go on with that conversation, but we won't. Um, <laughs> so a, 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 a small um, aggregation, the, the, the New South Wales DPI have got a, um, a program at the moment called, you know, Towards Net Zero. They, I have sat in on the methane reduction uh, half day workshop and yet only yesterday on the on the livestock, on the uh, vegetation workshop. They are uh, taking the ERF methods and actively trying to find ways um, that smaller landholders, it's become so obvious that it's the bigger landholders that, that have uh, taken part in this and also that a lot of those profits um, have gone to city-based uh, you know carbon project developers of which I'm not one uh, and so the, the question around aggregation 16 hectares it's hard it's really hard at the price of carbon at the moment um, uh, and what you could do on 16 hectares you could certainly there is nothing stopping you from having a project the, the smallest area for a tree planting is 0.2 of a hectare and for the soil carbon, there is no you know, specification, um, so you could do it. But the cost that uh, Lorraine has been speaking about, it's, it's um, what do they call that, economies of scale. Mm -hmm. And so for you to take on a soil carbon project on 16 hectares, I've still got to get the, the soil carbon, uh, the soil carbon testing rig to you. Um, I've, you've got the same number of drivers, you've got the same equipment, you know, those are the things. The audit costs would be high because uh, the auditor still has to get out there and then is only auditing, you know, six, 16 um, hectares. So those are the issues that people are trying to think their way around and New South Wales DPI is actively trying to find ways to assist LLSs. Um, and land care to be part of this. How can they do that 
and get around some of our other issues, uh, which are, you know, the necessity to hold an Australian financial services licence, if you're going to be speaking to anyone about what they may or may not be going to do with uh, with, with carbon credits. Um, so I hope that helps uh, the, uh, and or price of increase, uh, sorry, price of carbon increases. That's the other, you know, beauty of, uh, of then the areas becoming smaller. Thank you. Thank you, Lorraine, for your clarification and your thoughts um, as well. Sorry, I cut you off earlier and thanks, Louisa, for that. Um, we've got another question about um, how does biochar fit into these deliberations? Hmm. Not sure who would be the best um, person to answer that. I, biochar is specifically excluded from a soil carbon project. You cannot apply biochar to soil under a soil. Uh, the way that the method is at the moment, you cannot apply biochar. However, again, people thinking their way around these things, what if you fed the biochar as a feed additive through the animal and then and then either composted the manure or you're getting your, your biochar out onto, given that biochar is still very expensive to put on, um, as, as a fertilizer as well. Um, uh, so if you go and look at Mara seeds, M-A-R-A seeds, Stuart Larson has got products called green pig, green cow, green this, green the other. And what he's doing is putting activated, a percentage of activated biochar into animal feed, uh, which is improving the productivity of the animal. And he's done a lot a lot of research and he's, he's put a lot of money into it. CQ, you did the did the um, the research. And to me, this is a way that you can, um, you know, get around. So so we do work arounds in order to do it. But directly putting biochar onto soil is specifically excluded in, in the soil carbon method at the moment. Thanks, Louisa, and great that, that you can potentially think creatively about using biochar, but not in the soil. Um, okay, another question was, uh, can the same farming enterprise create credits from more than one methodology at the same time? For example, soil carbon plus livestock methane, and that was posted by Edward. Yeah, I, 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 I do know the answer, but carbon. So you, you, the answer is yes, you can. So if you've got 400 hectares, for instance, and you wanted to put, uh, oh, um, both of those on, you certainly can. Your issue is going to be the, the issue with the methane and needing a, a bigger herd. So, um, you, you know, that, that will be, and then when you've got a bigger herd, you're on the rangelands, uh, potentially, you know, the people who are engaged with the beef herd um, methane reduction method are people the size of AA Co. Mm. We're talking 50,000 head. Uh, you know, and they're they're being done through Paraway and those really big, you know, giant companies. So, um, and again, there is work on on how to reduce that. But in theory, yes. And in theory, also, you could have one soil carbon project. And Lorraine could have chosen, for instance, to have 200 hectares under a soil carbon project and 200 hectares under a tree planting project. Now, then you're talking uh, diversity of income and potentially, um, you know, lengthening the amount of um, time that you've got an income from your carbon projects as well. Yeah, so just adding to that, yes, we are involved with the methane project. Um, Louise is absolutely right. It's an aggregation of 50,000 head of cattle. <laughs> so you need a lot of cattle for those projects. Um, but that's also, again, it's a great story. It's a good uh, story to be able to tell whoever you're marketing your your credits to that you know we don't only have soil carbon credits we have this methane project going um, the biodiversity credits uh, is also something that we're doing and that's what I'm talking about credit stacking so you've got all of these things happening at the same time just to enhance your story um, and it doesn't necessarily mean you're going to make a lot of money out of them all but it just enhances the story Thanks, Lorraine and Louisa. There was just actually following on from the credit stacking, someone asked if um, by stacking credits, aren't you double dipping? Well, no, you're not, because one, if you look at soil carbon is sequestering carbon into the soil. Methane, um, the methane projects are reducing the methane levels in the atmosphere um, through the way we graze the cattle. 
So they're completely different things and they're, it's not double dipping because they're actually achieving different outcomes and reducing carbon um, or even in some cases nitrogen levels in the atmosphere um, through different methodologies. And when it comes to the, the biodiversity credits, well, that's not an area that you would necessarily, um, well, you wouldn't be doing soil carbon on that in that space because, yeah, you, I mean, the area we use, um, there are actually no cattle on that area at all. And, and you wouldn't be able to put cattle on them for the way we're doing our biodiversity credits. So it's actually a, an area that's locked up for that purpose within the farm. Yeah, and if you're trying, if you're doing biodiversity credits, which is uh, New South Wales, and then other states have got their their own, you know, uh, different programs, um, and then you wanted to, you tried to put a soil carbon over the top of it, they'd very quickly find out the clean energy regulator uh, would very quickly uh, uh, recognise that you've got, you know, uh, something else on on that land and uh you, you know they they won't uh, allow you to you, you you would have to exclude that area from your soil carbon project so mm -hmm. don't underestimate estimate the clean energy regulator and and how they make sure that we all stick to exactly what we're uh, what we're meant to be doing thanks for that clarification a um, couple more questions so how can farmers access debt finance secured against a carbon contract and once contracted, is the carbon added to the value to the asset value of the property? Mm. Nah. <laughs> um, okay. There's a bit of there's a bit of head scratching at the moment. For yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, this is this it's been is a difficult area. It, it's a bit it, of a difficult. It hasn't been that. Yeah, I mean, look, basically. Um, I will say one thing that environmental assets and drought resilience on a property is starting to be captured in the balance sheet of farms. So, um, and I've been a previous commercial banker, um, I understand how bankers think and work. Uh, I can absolutely guarantee you that drought and, and climate change is scaring the pants off both the banking sector, the financial sector, and insurance companies. And they actually will no longer lend money to farms that don't have um, some sort of risk management process in place for future dry periods. And that includes um, regenerative practices, it includes being able to store silage, it includes being able to protect the quality of your water, it includes being able to ensure you've got wind breaks, tree breaks, biodiversity on your farm. All of those things will sit on the balance sheets of farms uh, in the future, and that is coming fast. But even right now, you know, a banker is being, or an agribusiness banker is being trained in to go onto those farms and actually have a good look at what, um, in, in what way are they protecting their environment for future dry periods so and the insurance companies are doing the same thing so can you lend can you borrow money to go into um to carbon farming of course you can um you might want to reframe it um so that you can get that across because <laughs> uh, they don't like risky projects um but if you're framing it in the context of the co-benefits of um, pr making sure your farm is going to stack up in a in a dry period into the future. Um, well, yeah, of course you can you can borrow money for that purpose. If you're going to borrow money to say because I want to trade carbon um, and this is what I've got to do. Well, I think that's framing it in the lens that may be a little bit more difficult um, for you to get a loan. And also understand if you've got a mortgage on your farm, all of that, the paperwork involved with um, with that increases because, you know, there is a, another player involved in that farm. So you've got to prove ownership and control of the farm and having a mortgage atta attached to a bank. It doesn't mean you can't do it, of course. It just means it adds another layer of complexity. Sorry, you, a long you have to get um, what you, you have to get what's called eligible interest holder consent for anyone who holds an interest over the, and that would include, generally speaking, um, a, a bank 
Um, sometimes if it's leasehold land, then you have to get the uh, approval of the leaseholder. Um, and in areas where there is native title uh, considerations, then you need to get the um, approval of the native title uh, holders as well. And, and those, those three aren't necessarily easy. Um, Western Division New South Wales, for instance, they've now got so many carbon farm, uh, farming projects that to get approval from the leaseholder, which is, uh, you know, uh, the, the Western leasehold people, it's simply a piece of paper and it's a really easy process. But if you're cutting new ground, West Australia is a good example, South Australia is another good example. They haven't done it before and so, you, yeah, it, that, that, that process can take time. Thank you. Um, I don't think there were any questions specific to CARA um, and I think we're probably pretty much out of time at the moment um, for any, there were a couple more questions, but what I'll do is we'll forward those questions on to our presenters and if there are, um, if there's more information that they can provide, then we'll include that in the follow up, um, in a follow up email to all participants. Um, so I might hand back to Madeline for our wrap up and thank yous. Yeah, great. Thanks a lot, Angela, and thank you. I'd like to thank um, the presenters one more time for sharing a lot of really valuable information and painting quite an optimistic picture, I think, about soil carbon farming and certainly demonstrating that there are a lot of creative people out there on farms, in their own private enterprises and also in government agencies working to make it more of a feasible um, and beneficial activity. So that's a really interesting thing to watch, a space to watch and learn more about, I'd say. Um, I also would like to thank all of you there in the audience for asking questions and um, a couple of things to follow up. I will be sharing the recording once we get that up on our website. So I'll send you an email. And um, I would also be really grateful for any feedback through a short survey, um, which I'll send out with that email. And I'll send out any additional information from the presenters, for example, the look-see um, documentation and links to websites and ways of um, keeping up to date with the work that our three presenters and their colleagues are up to. Um, Yes, I just have one event to highlight. So we'll at Greater Sydney Local Land Services, also through the National Land Care Program, we'll be, we're organising a soil carbon field day on April 30th at the Local Land Services Demo Farm in Richmond. We've got Susan Orgel from DPI coming and we'll be organising some demonstrations as well around building up soil carbon. So if you're interested to learn more and you're able to come to Sydney, then save that date. But for the rest, thank you to everybody and uh, have a good rest of your day. And thanks also for bearing with the feedback at the beginning. And I'm glad that that was resolved, <laughs> especially for Louisa as well. Okay, thanks everybody. Okay. Bye -bye. Thank you.